After months of anti-government protests and political uncertainty, Iraq is now grappling with the worst fiscal crisis in decades. Iraq's economy and state budget are heavily reliant on oil income and have been hit hard by the sharp decline in global oil prices. The World Bank has projected GDP to contract by 9.7 percent, with the fiscal deficit expected to reach almost 30 percent of GDP. Iraq's newly appointed government, led by Mustafa al-Kadhimi, is now faced with a challenging task of implementing long overdue structural reforms, such as reducing public sector employment, while also keeping popular unrest at bay. I'm Simona Foltini in Baghdad, and as Iraq's fiscal crisis deepens, we ask what needs to be done to address it, and how can the new government overcome entrenched political interests that oppose reform, while also winning over a public that has lost trust in the political establishment. Ramzi Naman, the World Bank Special Representative to Iraq, talks to Al Jazeera. Ramzi Naman, Special Representative for the World Bank in Iraq. Thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. The World Bank recently put out a new report on uh, Iraq in which it warned that the economic crisis was the worst the country has seen since the fall of Saddam Hussein in 2003. Can you walk us through how we got to this point? Uh, I think these are very critical times for Iraq. And actually, uh, that report has reflected uh, very clearly the situation that we're in at this point in time, and which is actually an accumulation of of events that started in 2003. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the the uh, the crises that have hit Iraq uh, were 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 repeatedly uh, coming up at different instances in 2014-15, where we had the drop of oil prices, then the Daesh attack, which has actually uh, inflicted a lot of damages on Iraq, uh, not only in terms of reconstruction but also in terms of economy. So Iraq was hit by both uh, crises, the lowering of oil prices as well as of Daesh. Then the Iraq tried really to recover out of that. Unfortunately, the policies that were used then were not in the right place. And of course, that has actually led to the protests that we had in, in October and led to the resignation of the government. And those protests were actually coming out of a crisis and out of problems that emanated of a poor service delivery, of lack of jobs, on missing unemployment, especially in a in a society that is mostly built around young people. So they had a lot of expectations that unfortunately were not fulfilled. And all of this actually was compounded by the COVID-19 crisis that hit Iraq and the drop, the tremendous drop in oil prices that came along. So all of these elements just actually accumulated all over to end up in the situation that we are in at this point in time. It seems that we are repeating the same situation over and over. Is the government not taking the necessary action to really address some of these structural issues? It's actually, as I said at the beginning, it's a kind of accumulation. So all the governments that came into office had to deal with the situation as is. And unfortunately, there wasn't a kind of a vision that was put in moving the reform process forward. So there has been structural issues that existed since minute one. Uh, a, an enlarged and a bloated public sector based on the perception of people looking at employment as being staff within the government itself. So to the, to the, to the people around and to the culture in this area in, in generally, public uh, sector is a safety net for people. So it's a salary, it's a pension, not only for you, but even for your survivors. And so that has bloated things and had, has just uh, uh, inflicted a lot of uh, budget uh, problems and a lot of actually expenses on the on the burdens of the of the government itself. You mentioned the public sector, which is one of the hardest issues. If we just look at how it has uh, evolved over the years, in 2004, the public wage bill was 7% of public expenditure. That grew to 27% in 2014, and now it's almost 50% of the state's budget. Realistically, as a government, how do you go about? cutting salaries, reducing public sector employment, when that is such a big part of employment in general, and also when government jobs realistically are used to buy political support? Uh, of course, this is a very difficult situation at this point in time, because people feel that this is an entitlement. And as I said at the beginning, people look at it as part of the culture. So employment is looked at and linked to public sector employment. We have, uh, we have talked a lot, and I think it is the perception of governments that 
there should be a diversification. There should be a way of looking at how to move people within their mindset as well as within practice away from the public sector into the private sector. So that links us to the question of creating the conducive environment for private sector investment because the private sector is the sector that creates jobs, that brings in investment into the place. And I think this is where there is a kind of a trade-off, where a lot of elements should come into play. So if we want to look back at restructuring the public sector, we need to create an alternative, which is creating jobs outside the public sector within the private sector. Therefore, we need to create an environment that allows private sector to invest. On top of that, we have, I think, to include a lot of elements that would come into regulating the process so people would understand that moving out of the public into the private would keep their benefits so this allow this transfer of of benefits the portability of benefits as we call it so this is where we actually helped at one point in time to go for a unified pension law in Iraq, which brings both public and private into the same place. So people start understanding within their view of looking at the public and the private sector that they are almost the same in terms of looking one at the pension and most importantly looking at the salary scale between the two that matches. So people start having the option of moving from one to another. So I think this is where we have to start thinking of restructuring the public sector in that process. So it's not only reducing, it's not only cutting the benefits, but maybe on the other side, create the alternatives so that people start feeling that they have the option. But of course, this is very difficult to do, especially because the protests that we have seen in Iraq over the past few months, one of the major grievances was the lack of employment. So to be eliminating public uh, sector jobs in this kind of environment is very difficult. But if we just look at the figures, so for example, in April, uh, the government earned $1.4 billion in oil income. That's about $3 billion short of what it needs just to cover public salaries. Um, we have heard the Prime Minister, Mustafa al-Kadami, recently announced that he would be cutting salaries of higher level public sector workers. Is that enough or does the government really need to look at reducing overall employment in the public sector? Well, that is a statement that the government decides on. But what we can say is that basically on the side of the bank, we have done a lot of studies uh, that the government is looking at in terms of of looking at the size of the public sector and the expenses that are incurred on the government due to that to that inflated size of the public sector in terms also of looking at the governance the way this public sector is run looking at institutions looking at structure and of course including into that all of elements that are essential for good governance for a good performing public sector i.e referring to the question of corruption to the question of looking at good processes that are put in place and of course all of this implies on a good implementation of what is being done so projects are done properly people are benefiting from services uh, extremely poor people are benefiting from those transfers because there is a transparent and very clear technical process that allows these benefits to get to these people so all of these actually elements come together in looking at the reform of the public sector itself now what the government is going to go into is something that the government decides according to their own priorities, of course, and, and understanding very well what is the political environment that allows for that to move forward. And of course, in that, there is not only the political elite and the parliament that will be looking at this, but it's also the street, the protesters, that will be looking at any step that the government will move into that kind of a reform and try to see how credible is that, so that they can actually comply or probably not. Let's talk more about that political environment because I think that's very important. Of course, any kind of reform proposed by the current government would have to be voted on in Parliament, a Parliament that has very much resisted any substantial reform as demanded by the protesters. So realistically, how can this government go about implementing some very unpopular reforms going forward? The government, at the end of the day, knows very well the political environment, and I'm sure very well aware of the dynamics that exists and I'm definitely in no position to describe that but what I can say from the side of the bank is that we have provided and we are ready to provide all the essential support that is needed from the technical side because this is where they come the bank comes really with the with the expertise it has building on other experiences and other lessons learned from other countries in the world and try as much as possible to adapt it to the Iraqi situation of course in consultation with the government and with other with other players and try to see what works best. So we offer options, and it is really up to the government to decide on how to move forward. Of course, 
we're bringing uh, evidence-based, we're bringing technical, we're bringing numbers and statistics, looking at the situation that exists. And I think this is where the government could engage with the policymakers, with the parliament, and try to see how move it in the best way possible. And of course, taking into consideration what the people want. Because at the end of the day, we're looking at a poverty rate that is increasing. We're looking at an employment that is increasing. And again, going back to a young generation that is expecting a lot. It has waited a lot. It has been deceived a lot. So I think now it is the time to give them at least a positive signal that things would move in the right direction. And you've mentioned that you've put forward options. You've also met with the prime minister. You've met with the finance minister. What are the options that you're discussing and what kind of support is the government requesting from the World Bank? What I can say is that the bank has actually engaged with the government of Dr. Abdel Mahdi in the signing of a memorandum of understanding, which actually highlighted the main elements of a reform process that needs to be put on the table, highlighting three main pillars mostly. Uh, the looking at the diversification of the economy, looking at working to create an enabling factor for the, for the private sector to come into investment, and thirdly, try as much as possible to see how we can build the capacity of the government to work closely with the private sector in moving things forward in a partnership. What needs to be done to kickstart the private sector in Iraq? Uh, there are a lot of things that have been put in play into doing business. Doing business is trying as much as possible, and to say it simply, create the essential elements that would encourage a private sector to come and invest. Starting with simple processes, looking at the visa issuance, looking at the establishment of a company, looking at the possibility of starting up basic services that a company needs, all the way up to looking at the institutional requirements, regulatory processes, laws in land. So all of these are elements that would, if adjusted well and put in right place, allow the private sector to be encouraged to come into Iraq. But these are also things that I have heard time and time again over the past years. Why have these reforms not already been implemented? Because they have previously been recommended by the World Bank, by other institutions. So what has been the delay here? There has been a lot of changes. This place uh, actually has seen a number of governments come into, into office. And unfortunately, sometimes it so happened that any new government comes in, the discussion is a bit discontinued. And we have to start probably from scratch again or start maybe readjusting it according to the directions that the government has in mind. And of course, not to mention that there have been a lot of crises that have hit this place at a time when we have reached somehow a quite advanced stage in the dialogue. Then we had to wait or probably sideline a bit to try to see how we can manage the situation that's happening. We can see now a commitment to move forward. Uh, I think uh, a full conviction that private sector should be uh, uh, encouraged to come and invest. Uh, we have to make sure that we can support the government into that. And of course, throughout the process, we need to make sure that we are providing what is needed as a government and helping the government to do that to the uh, extremely poor in, first of all, providing them with what is needed. Secondly, improve the service provision, and most importantly, work on the human element in Iraq, work on the human capital. We have to keep in mind and we have to keep focused that there are a lot of people that need to be supported and a lot of people that need to be brought into safety away from poverty. Talking about the social safety net and poverty, the World Bank has warned that poverty rates could up to double as a result of the most recent economic crisis. But actually, the government uh, does spend quite a significant amount of uh, its budget on uh, social welfare, including for food rations, for uh, social security. Uh, what can be done to make this support more efficient so that it actually reaches the, the most poor, so it actually has an impact on the population? There are a lot of systems uh, for support and social assistance in this place and it's coming from different ministries. Uh, in addition to the fact that there are a lot of programs of social assistance that we need to think that uh, they, they need to move into a kind of a much more targeted approach. So make sure that all of these resources are focused on those who need it the most. So instead of just going into programs that are big and actually just throwing or at least dispersing money in different direction, try to focus on making those program hitting those who need it the most. So is there a lot of public waste? Because if you spend 14% of your budget on social security, there should be an impact, right? Of course, and that's, that's why, again, uh, you have a lot of, of probably a uh, lot of misused resources, if I may say. So we need to restructure this.
we need to look at this program and probably try to consolidate it based on the fact that we are looking at a good database of those who are in need. Keep that database live in the sense that it is updated continuously. But most importantly, it's not a question of just assisting people. It's a question of trying as much as possible to move these people away from poverty. So this is where the other supporting programs that would help people get out of poverty come into play, creating jobs, opening up opportunity, giving microcredits, working on rural environment to, create, to, to re revamp the agriculture sector. So all of these elements that would come into a social strategy that would help actually focus more and more on those on need, allow a fiscal space for the government instead of being somehow abused in a sense to be put in those productive projects that would create jobs and actually help people. Now, when I speak to some officials in government, some of them voice concern that they believe that the support from the World Bank is too theoretical. They say that they want support that will actually result in real changes on the ground because the, the reform areas that you're trying to address, it appears there is no really long-lasting impact, that the same issues come up over and over again. So what lessons can you draw from these past programs to make sure that any kind of reforms going forward take root within the state and actually have an impact on the ground? Uh, let, me, let me get to that in a minute, but let me just highlight that basically the bank is not only into the support on the financial front, as you described it, through those uh, what we call development project uh, loans, but just to say that the portfolio of the bank in Iraq is of $2 billion. So we have a number of projects that are operational in terms of delivering services, in terms of working on reconstruction, in terms of working on reform of institutions. So it's a $2 billion portfolio on these projects. So just to say that this is not theoretical per the, per the sense of the way you've described it. Sure, but I'm talking specifically about fiscal stabilization programs. And maybe let me read to you uh, an, an excerpt from your own internal evaluation of one of these uh, programs in 2010. Uh, the report read, the experience demonstrated that policy operation can work well in a high-risk environment when governments are motivated by fiscal stress, but that the sustainability of achievements is uncertain if the fiscal stress is removed. Can you comment on that, what exactly that means? All right. Let me go back again and say that when I'm discussing this portfolio, it's just to highlight the fact that when you go into the implementation of these projects as a government, because these, at the end of the day these are loans, you are improving the service delivery, you are improving the quality of life, and you're reaching to your, to your citizens. So this is part of rebuilding the social contract that we keep talking about. Of course, going back to your question on what was the lessons learned, and referring back to what you just said, is at the end of the day, the whole thing rotates around the political commitment. Yes, of course, in time of distress, government realized that we need to move on things. Unfortunately, going back to the economy of Iraq, this is an oil-based economy. So I'm so unfortunate to say that it all depends on the, oil of, uh, on the price of oil. So when the price of oil goes high, of course, the tendency goes less in implementation of reform. And unfortunately, this is so unfortunate because this is when you sit on the table and you discuss reforms, you expect to have a vision that regardless of the price of oil, and this is where the conception of understanding that we need to diversify the economy, we need to really look at non-oil revenues. So what can you as the World Bank do to ensure long-lasting commitment to these reforms even when the oil prices go up? That, that is something that we do our best to work with governments on. At the end of the day, uh, Simona, uh, you cannot force, and the, gov the bank is definitely not in the process of forcing anything. We come in full agreement on priorities with the government. We try to provide the support needed. And of course, we try as much as possible to highlight the importance of that, especially in establishing the link of the, the economy in general, the welfare of the, of the people in general, and most importantly, looking back at that social contract. So the bank provides the support and the bank provides the advice. But at the end of the day, the political decision is the decision of the government. I think it's very uh, illustrating to look back uh, to February 2018, the Kuwait conference, when the international community raised 30 billion US dollars to help 
the reconstruction in areas that were most affected by the war against ISIL. The World Bank hosted, financed that conference. $30 billion were raised. What has become of that? Uh, the bank helped. It's actually the Kuwaiti government who has hosted the, the conference and has, has helped in, in making it a, an event. It was a big event. Uh, what happened after that, unfortunately, that was not followed up properly. And it's, it's not only me saying it as a bank, but it is also what the uh, Prime Minister of Finance has said it clearly. Uh, and I think now the government is quite serious. Uh, on following up on this and I think that the visit of the Minister of Finance to the Kuwait and the, uh, the discussion that they have started with the Kuwaitis uh, is actually picking up on this uh, in terms of seeing how can we really go back and try to see what were the commitments in the Kuwait and how we can move forward on that. From your perspective, what was the reason why it was not followed up and what does it tell us about the state's capability to actually implement these large-scale projects? I think if you want to go back and or if the government wants to go back really and look at, this, at the Kuwait commitments and try to engage again with the countries that have expressed their willingness to pledge, uh, I think this is where the government has to present probably its current view on things. Uh, things are different from where we left in Kuwait. So now we have gone through a crisis and we have all seen the consequences of that crisis. I think the government will have to go back with a new approach. It's picking up on what was there in Kuwait, yes, but with a new approach and a new vision. So we will be talking, and I think the government will be talking, of course, of what is the step, what is coming up, how that money is going to be spent. And I think it's going to give a different approach to the process that would somehow instill trust in the minds of the countries that have expressed, expressed their willingness to pledge. Uh, and I think the, the environment is somehow quite conducive to that. It's, of course, not just the limited capability of, of state institutions to, to implement projects, but there's also the issue of corruption. Iraq ranks 162 out of 180 countries on Transparency International's Corruption Index. And if we compare that uh, again to 2004, it used to be 61 out of 145. So corruption has increased substantially over the past years. How does that factor in your consideration, um, you know, in supporting this government, you know, as, as an international institution that provides support, is there a feeling that the government should first look towards itself and address corruption before asking for external help? Uh, I think the government is quite aware of this. And uh, uh, on our side as a bank, uh, we have and we have been asked and we will provide all the support needed in terms of instituting the good elements of good government, of good institutions. But again, it all depends on the decision and the uh, political commitment of the government to move into the process. I think now the government is trying to move into the process. One, looking at the inflated public sector, try to organize it. And most importantly, how to move that private sector, uh, public sector, excuse me, in being quite productive in delivering projects, in making things happen. And of course, when we're talking of public sector, it's only fair to say that there are a lot of good elements within the public sector, within the government institution, a lot of good elements. And unfortunately, they are somehow bound by a structure that is quite rigid. And unfortunately, that is a lot influenced by some political interferences. So I think if there is a political will and there is a decision to move forward into a process of reorganizing the public sector, one internally in a kind of an internal kitchen reorganization, but most importantly in times of moving it into a better delivery of services. That will reshape and revamp the whole perception of people looking at the public sector in terms of, of being really able to produce what it needs. And again, I go back to the question of reestablishing a new social contract between the citizen and the government. And of How course, do you go about that? Because the trust between the citizens and the government has really been broken. The, you know, if you go out and listen to the protesters, what they're saying about the government, they're asking for a complete overhaul of the political system because they consider it as not reformable. This is where I think the government needs to be sending some positive signals. At the end of the day, unfortunately, in view of the absence of the trust, you have to make the public see that there are some changes that are happening. It is not only the problem of the Prime Minister, and it's not only the problem of the Minister of Finance or the problem of the Minister of Republic. This is the problem of all Iraq. So every citizen needs to feel that they are in a problem. And to be able to do that, 
we have to be transparent. The government needs to be transparent, really, in putting the problems on the table and saying, listen, this is where we are. But also, at the same time, putting the solution on the table, minding an expectation that is relatively acceptable because the situation and the political environment needs to be taken into consideration. What are the priorities of the government? How to really say it to the, to the people? And how to actually deliver on what we are promising so that people will start listening and will start believing with time so hopefully they will get to trust us again. So I think this is where the vision needs to be installed, where people would have a say, people would comment, but also the government would put them in a position to say, listen, this is not our problem only, this is everybody's problem. So we're approaching it as a national unity problem. Certainly a difficult road ahead. Ramzi Naman, Special Representative for the World Bank in Iraq, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you very much, Simona. Thank you very much for Al Jazeera.